Hello, welcome to the lecture on period seven, and this one is dealing with the New Deal, and this is gonna look at A, B, and C of 7.1.3, that during the 1930s, policymakers responded to the Great Depression through creating what's known as a limited welfare state, and redefining the goals and ideas of the American liberalism. And looking at part A, the New Deal attempted to end the Great Depression, uh, providing relief, recovery, and reform, those three R's. So, a man for their time, Herbert Hoover, self-made man, very successful in life, but never really faced adversity until he's as president, and then it's he's not really prepared to, to handle it. He's never really had to handle this kind of adversity before, and he's unprepared. And he did too little too late, and doesn't really have the philosoph philosophical uh, background uh, to to make changes the changes that are needed Franklin Roosevelt sort of the opposite you know born wealthy born into a successful family and then faced adversity before he became uh, president of the United States with the loss of his uh, his legs through disease and this gave him a lot of character and depth and sympathy and a willingness to to try new things and to experiment and Franklin should always be compared to his, his uh, distant cousin, uh, Teddy. Uh, they have a lot of similarities that you can see, but their personalities are extremely different. And we can see Franklin's uh, personality of good-natured, patient listener. He was the right man at the right time, and which is often perhaps why he is cited as the greatest American president. And... His, as a politician, a humble politician because of what had happened with the loss of his legs uh, through disease as an adult. It made him a very humble and compassionate and sympathetic person who understands that uh, good people suffer bad things through no fault of their own and that perhaps others like the government should be there to provide and assist these people who have suffered uh, nothing because of their own uh, doing and he's got a very good political wife as well they are in a wheelchair he's rarely pictured in a wheelchair but he could not stand without assistance here he is holding on to uh, someone's hand and campaigning is yes we can but not really making a lot of promises uh, that uh, when, when he gets into office he's not coming out with a lot of specifics just saying that yes we can and there was a very strong mandate. There's Eleanor. She's of a progressive. She's of this idea that government can and should get involved. Uh, she's a woman progressive, very much involved with women's rights issues, and uh, very sympathetic to the working class, and uh, one who's uh, aware of the problems of all in society, including African Americans and women and other minorities. And she's coming up through uh, this this. Uh, legacy of progressive idealism and women's rights. Not a good personal relationship with FDR after a certain time. You know, he, he had been caught with having an affair with his assistant. And so what, uh, what their personal life was like, not too clear, but clearly the, these two work very well as a team and they respected each other as politicians and as people. Coming in with a strong mandate. Yes, we can. Okay, what are you going to do? He doesn't have a really much of a plan. He's going to experiment. He's going to try things. That's the idea. He's going to come in and just sort of see what works and what does not work. And uh, he humiliated Hoover. And this is the beginning of a shift uh, of, of the Democratic Party, FDR's party, which is going to bring a lot of people under a big umbrella of politics. And coming in with the ideas of, uh, you know, government should get involved and coming in with the idea that the government should pump money into the economy, which is this idea of a demand side economy, uh, give the money into the people through tax cuts or other programs, get people to spend that money and that will lead to higher employment, which is the opposite of the trickle down, which would be in the policy of the 1920s and had sort of seemed to not be working. So they're gonna give this demand side a go.
which is a new idea, a very new idea. And Keynes himself, who sort of come up with this, um, didn't really come up with it until sort of after the, uh, the New Deal had sort of begun. So it's coming in uh, what's sort of the, the memory device is the three R's. Uh, we're going to reform the system. We're going to provide relief to people who need help. We're going to recover the economy, get employment back up. And of course, hey, we're going to get reelected too. That's the fourth R. And a shotgun approach. We're just going to try things and see what works, see what sticks. Now, it comes in in the first 100 days and gets a lot done. And keep in mind, it's Congress who's getting a lot done. But, of course, the president is encouraging it and, uh, and uh, doing a lot himself. So, first thing is the banks need to be addressed. The confidence in the banks has to be restored, and we've got to get the banking system back up. So, what does he do is the banks close down. All banks are, are shuttered. The doors are closed. You can't go in. You can't get your money. And this stopped the withdrawal of monies. And then they investigated all of the banks and uh, said, okay, if a bank was okay, there's no, no problems. You're allowed to reopen. If there were problems with the bank, then, uh, then there would be some sort of government assistance through the Emergency Banking and Relief Act, this law, and uh, sort of set up loans and uh, money for banks that were having problems with the solvency. And then he did something that no president had ever done before. He utilized this new technology, the radio, to speak directly to the American people, came right into their living rooms, very personal, right there in his calm, soothing voice of everything is okay. You could trust the banks. Please, uh, good people of America, take your money. You've got it under the bed, locked away in a box somewhere. Please take it out of there. And tomorrow morning, go to your local bank and put the money back in the bank. Your money is safe. And people listened to him, trusted him, and followed his advice. And it worked. And they returned their savings back into the banks. Confidence was restored into the banks. And on day one, well, the first week, the banks have been restored. And that major problem that uh, caused the Great Depression has, uh, has been dealt with in a, to a large extent. And this is showing the number of banks that are failing. And we can see him coming in in 1933. And immediately we're seeing the effects of that. Prohibition ended. The idea was, hey, in America, we need a drink. And there's also good economics behind, you know, getting this industry back up again. And then into the reform. Okay, the financial system, the stocks, the banks, they need rules. They need re regulation. And coming in with sort of four or well, three ideas here, and all of these would last. These are not just sort of like one-time sort of things. These are laying a new foundation for the economic system of the United States that uh, largely remains in place today. The Glass-Steagall Act separated savings and investment bankings, so banks cannot take your savings and risk it on stocks. They just can't do that. And so your money uh, is a lot safer, or your bank is a lot safer. It's, it cannot be so risky and dangerous with your money. And there's insurance on your deposits. If the bank fails, uh, you can get back a large portion of your money through insurance that the government will help to see to. Uh, the stock markets are much better managed. Companies must be a lot more honest and transparent with uh, how their company is doing, all those um, um, shady dealings that had been happening before on the stock market. The fraud cannot happen any longer. And they're going to police the stock market and no more insiders trading and sort of stock fr frauds. And finally, to be able to, to have an inflationary economic policy and get uh, money pumped into the economy, he's going, uh, they're going to leave the gold standard and allow you know, full printing of uh, government money, allowing the government to increase the money supply if it feel, uh, sees a need to do so and to be able to manipulate interest rates better. And this is a key idea of that Keynesian or demand side economics. They need to be able to control the money supply and not have it tied to any 
uh, gold or any other sort of um, standard. And then this is still within the first 100 days. Uh, other areas, the CCC um, work for youth. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. And just sort of uh, cash uh, for work programs to get uh, people having jobs. Now, did this do a lot to solve unemployment? Not really, but it provided a lot of dignity and did help to, to some extent. Now, the CCC, FDR loved this. And this was uh, his sort of like his little child, this this program, and he was very much involved in it. And it was a very successful program. It took people, young men who are quite, you know, revolutionary, a lot of them, uh, and took them away from the cities and out into the countryside and removed that sort of revolutionary threat that's in the air. Uh, this idea of a socialist or communist revolution, which feeds off of, uh, of unemployed young men, well, let's get them busy, get them doing something. And so they would go off to, to camp, to work, and uh, out, out in the countryside, and then they get paid, but they don't get the money. The money goes to their families, and, and they would be taken care of out in the camps, being fed and provided shelter for, and the and then the money that they are earning, um, not going to help them, but help mom, dad, and others, and was seen as a largely uh, successful program. We'll see more of it there. Still, first one hundred days, you know, a lot of legislation. Farming needs help, and production problems there. They paid farmers to not farm to bring production down and raise prices and they deliberately destroyed burned crops killed pigs they killed like six million pigs and uh, as a way to reduce inventory and raise prices and get farming managed and regulated and to a large extent they still do this today and home insurance for people who'd been losing their homes because of bank failures or other reasons who've lost their jobs, making it so that people are, are easier to uh, not lose your home and that there's uh, government help there if you're having problems with your home mortgage. And then one of the more controversial acts, the National Industrial Recovery Act. And this one was really the one that you might call as a bit of a, like a socialist or command economy where they're trying to come in with price regulations, price controls, wage controls, and a lot of sort of what they call codes or, or sort of um, maintaining uh, sort of a, a industry control over prices and wages, not letting the free market decide it, but letting it be decided um, um, through manipulation. And this this idea of, of sort of a socialist command economy, you got to put it within the context of what's happening at the time. This is happening when you know uh, Germany's turning to, to Hitler and the Nazis. The fascists in Italy are doing well. Japan's under a militaristic government, and these governments are popular and are are leading their countries out of the Great Depression, and. So it's a time when the the um, you know this is established during a time of rising fascism and authoritarianism, and people looking for you know authority figures, somebody who's willing to try things, experiment, push the boundaries, push the constitutional limits of the government, and see what might work. And so this this program, which was extremely controversial because it flies in the face of, of everything that America sees as, as dear, you know, that freedom of the economic system, the free market system, and the constitutional limits are sort of being um, uh, broken, yet it was widely popular, extremely popular. And it was promoted as a patriotic act. And businesses, shops would place the logo of the NRA, uh, which is an eagle with, with lightning in it, um, and but there was no real way to enforce it and the program itself was largely unsuccessful and a lot of people cited as uh, this shift away from the free market as making the Great Depression worse and lasting longer but it's sort of showing that that approach that FDR was had of well let's try it 
let's experiment. Let's do it, you know, and, and see what happens. And if it doesn't work, okay, we'll, we'll move on. So it's showing that experimental side. Um, did do a lot through public works administration, a lot of infrastructure as well was sort of the sub part of it, but the Supreme Court eventually would rule this program unconstitutional and it would be sort of dropped as an idea. But we can see here people promoting it, a parade to promote it, you know, this idea that this is the patriotic thing to do, the shift away from the free market. You know, the free market capitalist society being seen as a failure leading to the Great Depression, so let's give this a go. Um, and then another controversial program, we're still in that first 100 days, remind you, uh, was the TVA, which was a major infrastructure investment in uh, poor rural areas to develop uh, electricity and, uh, and uh, help out uh, one of the poorest parts of the country in the Tennessee Valley. Um, controversial because the government would become involved in what was a private business of selling electricity and this is seen as unfair and it would be challenged within the courts as well but a major uh, infrastructure program here building lots and lots of dams and power plants to provide cheap electricity in an area that didn't really have a lot of electricity and this graph here is showing you know um, the percentage of people in the united states who have electricity in their homes and we can see uh you know um that, that one group that really had been left behind in the 1920s getting electricity brought into their homes through the TVA. Okay, so that's the first New Deal. Now, the, the second New Deal, which sort of follows that first 100 days, would uh, bring in a lot of programs that remain still to this day, but this is when the challenges to FDR and uh, start to really be put up as people uh, on both sides of the political spectrum challenged the program. So it became under attack from both liberals, his side, he's saying it's not doing enough, uh, we need more. Uh, more socialism or sort of a more government intervention in it's you're not solving the problems or from conservatives on the other side who are saying whoa you you're, you're this is unpatriotic this is against uh, the the values of our country and uh, it's too much government involvement and you know FDR is turning into a bit of a dictator and you know this is a time when dictators are taking control of, of much of Europe and elsewhere and it's very real concerns that FDR is really pushing the boundaries of power set up by the Constitution. So liberal opponents, far, uh, Father Charles Coughlin, uh, father a Catholic priest, and uh, he has a radio program that uh, 30 million people every week listen to out of a population of 130 million. So he's got a very big voice and he wants uh, a guaranteed income. He wants the banks nationalized and uh, was seen as uh, quite radical. Uh, Dr. Francis Townsend, who wants a pension plan and uh, his biggest threat, uh, FDR's biggest threat is a demagogue, Senator Huey Long, who if he ran might have split uh, the Democratic vote. Uh, but he would be uh, assassinated. And he's coming with a plan called Share of Wealth, which is, hey, tax the rich, give to the poor. Robin Hood, straight up. It's just $5,000 to everybody. And a very popular idea. And uh, uh, But as, uh, fortunately for FDR, he was assassinated. There's Huey Long. And coming in with you know, more programs. And the Work uh, Progress Administration, WEA, PA coming in to provide more employment, not just sort of public work programs, but work for artists and, and musicians and uh, and uh, educated people as well. And a lot of murals is all across the United States. There are post offices with these sort of paintings done in. Here's this uh, Google search for them. They're all over the place. That this was all done through the Works Program Administration. So it's not just sort of construction work. Let's give work to, to artists as well. Uh, housing uh, programs uh, coming in and social security or a pension plan which today is a major part of the US budget it's about a third of the US budget is social security so uh, a huge legacy was coming in with this pension plan the Social Security Act labor reached its high point with the Wagner Act which allowed uh, recognized all unions for the first time and allowed all labor to organize into unions and unskilled workers quickly began organizing into what's known as the CLO which would merge with the AFL 
and um, and John Lewis, the leader of that, or sorry, the CIO, I got that wrong, and labor becoming much more assertive and successful, seeing that the government is really on their side and leading to a number of strikes in the second half of the 1930s, including what's known as the sit-down strike, where the workers really take control of the factory and uh, just sit down. Minimum wage, uh, maximum hours in all businesses created uh, at the federal level if they did any interstate trade. So labor really coming into in recognition for really the first time and with the, with the government fully on the side of labor and listening to the side of the working class and putting through uh, programs to help the, the working class for the first time. This is what we mean by a sit-down strike. The workers take control of the factories and then sit down. Quite successful. And he's elected in a landslide. And so people are saying, hey, despite some of the problems, we like the New Deal. Keep it up. Keep going. But he would face a challenge from the Supreme Court. That checks and balances is in play. And the Supreme Court, which is quite conservative, and a lot of the judges who are old and would like to retire feeling I need to stay on as a check to the power stretching of this president who's really pushing the limits of his of his powers. And two programs are put under attack. The AAA, they say this violates the Tenth Amendment and it's not a power given to Congress. This is reserved for the states. You cannot do this. And the National Recovery Act, as we talked about, uh, saying that this is uh, executive powers that really belong to the legislature and it's a shot down as well. And the Supreme Court in general is challenging a lot of the New Deal programs. And so FDR says, okay, well, let's, uh, let's change the court. And he came in with a proposal um, to bring in more judges that would uh, would side with him. And so he proposed a law that every judge over the age of 70 uh, who was not retiring, for each one of those, FDR could appoint a new judge. And this would allow him to bring in, I think, six new judges and uh, increase the Supreme Court from nine judges to 15. And there's nothing in the Constitution that says he can't do this. Um, but there was a lot of people saying, uh, that's really stretching your powers and really um, um, eliminating the whole idea of the checks and balances. And so there was a strong opposition to FDR to not do this. But at the same time, uh, the Supreme Court sort of got the message that, hey, the American people do not want us to sort of stop the New Deal and to allow it to go forward. And so he didn't get to add in a lot of judges, but what he did get to was the Supreme Court to uh, to be a little bit looser in its interpretation and allowing a lot more of the New Deal to go through. And yeah, here, all I said is one and six more judges and then all hell breaks loose. And so everybody says, you know, what the hell are you doing? can't do that and this is you know he people really feeling that he's uh, if he was able to sort of cut off the supreme court that he would take the united states and swing it into dictatorship and that it was the supreme court was the only thing that was really stopping him from being a dictator was the argument being made okay so that brings us to the final thing okay of the the new deal uh that it did not end the great depression but it did leave a lot of legacies and uh long-term political realignment and we're gonna get to that uh, in a moment so did it end the great depression not not really um you can look at the graphs you know unemployment it would only be with world war ii that employment would go back to, to being normal again um, but it did do a lot to relieve a lot of the suffering provided uh pride to a lot of people who had lost their work and uh even though it, uh, yeah, it didn't solve unemployment, it it did a lot to sort of provide relief, and they spent a lot of money, uh, a lot of money, but not really compared to the amount of money that future governments would sort of spend. 
and really embracing the ideas of John Maynard Keats. If you look at the, the long view, a pragmatic approach, but not coherent, as we said, a shotgun. Let's see what works, what does not. Did not solve the Great Depression, World War II did. Um, changed the role of the executive branch. I'm going to touch on that again in a, in a moment. Uh, this idea that government is the provider, the protector, and that the government has a role in the economy. It's not radical, and uh, the checks and balances did work. Did it save capitalism? Did it weaken capitalism? It's still up for debate, and we'll maybe look at that in class. And leading to the fifth party system, and where Democrats are going to dominate for the most part, with uh, one exception, uh, in the uh, 1950s, where Democrats are going to control the presidency and much of Congress, and a lot of people sort of going under this huge umbrella of uh, the Democratic Party, what's known as the New Deal Coalition, where uh, Catholics, Italian Americans, uh, and uh, others coming in, Jews supporting them, African Americans moving away from the party of Lincoln and and trickling into the Democratic Party, especially as the Great Migration and uh, city population of African Americans increased. They got the they got the city voters, they got the farm voters, and they got the white Southerners, uh, the old Democrats, unions. The, the working class, the immigrants are all sort of under this and this philosophy of um, social liberalism and uh, social democracy and uh, Keynesian economics and going to dominate for the next 36 years, as we said. And this idea that the president is the government. Now, this didn't start with FDR. You can maybe look to his cousin, Teddy Roosevelt, or even go back to Lincoln to seeing this idea. But the idea, you know, that the president embodies uh, the entire government, we sort of see with the New Deal. And we see growth of the executive branch, direct communication of the president with the people, and uh, the president pushing the policy. Even though it's Congress who's passing all of these laws, it's the president who's beating the drum and leading the way in it. And finally, sort of a new social contract uh, that, uh, this is a quote here, Roosevelt asserted and the public accepted that the role of the central government from now on would be to secure the material well-being of the American people. Before, from the founding of the country, up to the New Deal, the thought had been that government existed to defend the borders, deliver the mail, protect your rights, and get out of the way. But Roosevelt had uh, bigger ideas and changed the, the role and responsibility of the government to be a provider, being a protector, and steering the way, uh, steering the, uh, the country, the American people, into recovery despite the loud mouth and ugly detractors uh, pointing at the way that the idea is that yes he led them out of the depression and into recovery and we're going to end it there all right thank you very much for the